So this this tonight's theme, and it's going to be a beautiful open conversation, is the union of science and spirituality. And as uh, Gino and I have been pursuing this for quite a while, in that Gino is in science. He's a professor at Hong Kong Polytechnic. I visited him there, had an absolutely wonderful time. He's he stayed here on the property. Uh, we've been at Burning Man. We've done experiments, the great experiments at Burning Man together for uh, several years. And we kind of both live at that liminal intersection. I call it like the liminal ridge between the magical world or the mystical world and the, maybe the more mechanical world. Because sometimes they talk, talk about it as science and spirituality. But mechanics are really about the explanation of the gears, how the gears mesh and how things actually work. And the mystical is sort of more coming into our experience uh, and is very personal, can be very personal, but it also can be universal. You can have a universal mystical experience. You know, like Rick Strassman documents in the, the spirit, the, the DMT molecule, that there's commonality between those experiences with one one chemical, one compound. But what I might put forward is the mechanical underlies everything. So uh, right away, you in the audience would say, well, he's definitely not a strong panpsychist. You know, and Gino and I have both been at the uh, SAND conference and science and non-duality and these conferences. And there's a field or a group called strong panpsychists who would hold that that spirit or consciousness or however you define it underlies everything in the universe and is primal and that uh, everything comes out of that, including life itself. I'm definitely on the gearhead side of things. I've spent most of my life seeking an, uh, uh, an explanation for how life began on the earth. And about three years ago, and in fact, this month, if you go to Astrobiology Journal, uh, the Astrobiology Journal, it's uh, the major field for astrobiology. It's a special issue called Hot Springs 2, and we're the lead article on that issue. And it's, it's really quite amazing. I mean, it's our cover art showing a hot spring in the Hadean uh, time four billion years ago, where a cycling system, a gearhead mechanical system, is our uh, preferred explanation for how life was lifted beyond the background of physics. Presuming that physics doesn't have something like consciousness, doesn't have lifelike properties, it is a machine. The universe is a big mechanical machine and that life is lifted by a regular kind of cycling process. And we've actually proven, well, I wouldn't say it's a more of a proof, we've empirically shown that the first steps of this hypothesis work. And uh, in February, we went to New Zealand where a, we repeated a set of experiments in a hot spring where we literally laid down, in one case, mica sheets, monoatomic, super flat mica sheets where you peel off the top layer with scotch tape, place them into the hot spring environment, and hydrated and dehydrated solutions of RNA monomers and uh, pure RNA monomers and s several other solutions involving lipids on those hot spring, in the hot spring environment at 93 Celsius on a hot plate using the acidic waters. We shipped those to the University of, Cop of Denmark, uh, U University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and they put it under the atomic force microscope and we saw tangles and circles of RNA polymerized from its building blocks polymerized, uh, multi-thousand mer length polymers, well needed to create what would be called a ribozyme or a, a chemical widget able to reproduce itself and, 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 and enable catalytic activity. So we did it again. We reproduced it again, and that's how empirical science progresses. It's gearhead people show us once, but then show us repeat, 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 repeat until we believe then come up with a physical mechanism. And for us, it was wet, dry cycling. That as you dry the solutions down, it gets more concentrated. The lipid layers squeeze down flat, creating a two-dimensional 
matrix and it pushes the polymer uh, monomers around until they link up, even double-stranded products. And it worked. And so that's gone off for publication. We we feel confident. There's three or four universities involved in this. And what it is, is the first time that uh, in the history of science that we've taken an experiment right to a, uh, a uh, what's called an analog. There would have been these kind of hot springs on the early Earth four billion years ago on big volcanic islands, likely. They would have been fed by rainwater. They would have been cycling with hot and cold and wet and dry cycles with geysers, just as they are today all across the Earth, and they were on Mars. And it's a machine. You fill a pool with water and you dry down. You fill and dry down and fill and dry down. And the monomers, the organics, the soup, if you will, the primordial soup, comes from meteoritic sources, i.e. dust particles coming from the solar system formation, meteorites that blow apart and blow all this organic stuff, rains down on the landscape, washes into these pools, and then is cycled. And it's everything you need. It's organics, it's uh, lip, uh, membranes, basically fatty acid membranes. And so this is a natural engine, a mechanical explanation for how the first protocells then appeared, which then evolved into the living cells of microbial mats. And in right here, this was the publication uh, three years ago uh, of our work, um, our, first, our first concept of, of how this worked in, on the cover of uh, Scientific American magazine. And that's actually the graphic that I helped them develop with the cycling through wet, dry, and moist on a volcanic, uh, so you can hardly see it, on a volcanic landscape with a little pool cycling there. So that, that's what brought it to the public. The publication uh, this month in Astrobiology is the full hypothesis, ready to test for the next 50 years. It's the full uh, guide to this. It's called the Hot Spring Hypothesis for an Origin of Life. And when I was talking about the things that were falling from space, this is some of them. So I can't really see, and there's a little kind of uh, smudge or little muddy exudate. There it is right there. See that? In the bottom of this, this is a ground-up sample of the Murray meteorite, which is older than the Earth. It's 4.6 billion years old. And if I smell it, so this fell on uh, and was picked up by meteorite hunters. I smell it, it's very smoky. You can give it a, a whiff if you like to. Uh, it's super smoky. And what I'm smelling is the primitive organics of the solar system in formation. Those are, I'm smelling polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in here. This is some of the building blocks falling on the earth in abundance four billion years ago, feeding the warm little poles. And so then what happens in those pools is trillions of these protocells form with polymers within them, and it acts like a big roulette wheel that turns and turns and turns and turns like a machine and starts to select polymers within those protocells for function to keep their compartments together. Boom, 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 boom. And you have a giant machine that is selecting through wet, dry synthesizes the polymers, wet buds off protocells, and moist allows them to get together and interact. And we've now done this in the actual hot springs in Rotorua, New Zealand, as well as the lab. And that system cycles innumerable times with starts and failures until one day an engine kicks on. And that engine is the first en enzymes, the first polymers, the protein polymers, synthesized by templating off of perhaps RNA or DNA, start to do jobs. And they start to make their protocells more tough. They make pores in them. They start to make building blocks on their own, all driven by the hot spring inputs. And then gradually, these compounds begin to learn how to capture sunlight so they can live independently of the hot spring environment. So the protocells float outside the hot spring into a stream, but they can do photosynthetic capture of energy. 
And then you're on your way to the microbial world, which leads to this. And this is, many of you have seen this famous rock, the most famous stromatolite in the world. It's in three Weta Workshop animated films at this point. Its name is Precious. And it's three point, just over three billion years old. And it's from some of the oldest fossil evidence for life on Earth. And you can see those ridges. Those ridges are left are the imprints of microbial mats growing at a lake shore three billion years ago and leaving these imprints uh, by the fact that they sequester sand grains together. And stromatolites are the most common ubiquitous megafossil on the earth for most of its history. And this one's a freshwater one. They've been finding them in hot spring environments at 3.5 billion years ago. So when you're thinking in terms of life and spirit and all that, this is grounding because this is our common ancestor, truly our common ancestor of all life. And, you know, one of the things that, that people do get a little separated from the concept because we get into our heads and we get into models and those who are sort of professing that consciousness was everywhere in the, in the cosmos, if they were transported back to the time of Earth that this was growing in, a sort of stinky microbial mat at lake shores, they would need a spacesuit. They would need an environment suit with an oxygen supply because there's no breathable free oxygen in the environment. They would see a planet of red rocks, acid rain, uh, a strange looking sky. For them, it would be like, we're kind of on a place that looks like Mars, but it has water in it. It has a lot of volcanoes and it has tidal waves, a bigger moon, uh, and acid rain. And if I, I put it to you that if they, they went back to such a world, they wouldn't be making the argument that consciousness was primal they would be brought to the reality that the world was made and it was made by living organisms that were cycling, cycling and cycling and cycling. And when you get to that point, when you realize that it's 3.5 billion years of the cycling of the living world, powering up a complex enough, uh, oxygen filled enough, uh, eukaryotic cell complex cell uh, complex enough to power the uh, multicellular organisms which then power the plant and animal and fungal world which then power neuron building and then all the way up to uh, to conscious awareness uh, self-awareness say in cetaceans maybe first on the earlier in some other organisms you kind of see consciousness or spirit, if you will, as a uh, running on the substrate of the cycling world of initially protocells driven by energy. It's really a mechanical substrate, exquisitely driven cycle upon cycle upon cycle <clears throat> that could create, and this is a hypothesis, that creates an internetworked system that shapes probability itself. And that's the uh, diagram. I don't know if Shen Shen can bring that diagram up that we posted with the, uh, with the announcement. This diagram was produced to capture, to capture this idea in one image, that where spirit and science meet, where uh, the mystical or the networked or the ethereal or the luminous or the numinous meets the mechanical, uh, the empirical, the matter energy conversion. You know, what, how does it all get into one uh, unified field? Well, thank you so much, Shenzhen. So if you, if you'll permit me, you know, dear listener, you know, how they, uh, how they say it sometimes, this is a vision that came to me about a year and a half ago. And it was a complete single vision of this whole process. So what we do is we start at the bottom with the cosmogenesis, with the implosion or the, the explosion, 
an inflation of the universe. That then creates these complex modules, you can mo molecules you can see it e on either side, that leads to geology. And you have, there's all our rocks for our rocky world that has a combination of rock and water and atmosphere, the three things that, that anyone in the exoplanet search for life believes you have to have can't have life starting on a gas giant or something that's incredibly dry and hot. So then you see the little hot spring pumping the water. It's, it's, that, it's that ratchet. And this is where we think life can start because we're now showing that in the field. And what that ratchet actually does, I did another thought experiment about three years ago when I was invited to come to a, a conference called Science and Non-Duality. Uh, oh, actually, this is for Science of Consciousness uh, in San Diego. And Gino knows this well, because I think, Gino, you might you hosted it in, in Hong Kong one year. So I said to myself, what on earth do I know about consciousness? You know, really nothing. I really haven't cracked a book on it. Uh, what do I know about any explanation for consciousness? So I started from scratch. I said, if we can go back to the unwinding of life all the way back to its start point, discover the very properties that led to the living world, those very properties will still be operating the living system. They'll still be at the core of all of life. Could those properties tell us what, how, what makes consciousness run, if consciousness is running on the substrate of life? And I thought, well, that's a reasonable hypothesis. And what I came up with in another visionary download, this is how I work, is this PIM formalism here. And if you look at my SAND 2017 uh, talk, it actually goes through where PIM comes from. But it's really simple. If you have a little protocell that is clustering things together and crowding uh, molecules together, like we talked about the polymers, that's a probability shaping machine. Because when you crowd chemicals together, you increase the likelihood of them interacting and, and reacting. So I thought the first property of any system associated with life is to, pro is to increase probability against the background of physics. Then where the I comes in is when you have the protocells clustered together at the bottom of the pools, as we're seeing, or in our laboratory vials, they create an interactive network automatically. One protocell has a reaction which creates products which diffuse to another one. And a, and a network of interconnections cr are created. And in physics, in pure in star formation and in geology and whatnot, networks are not really spontaneously arising in, in the universe at large. They tend to be only in the living world, these networks of, of symbol passing and signaling. And then we realize that it's this sludge, this uh, ignoble sludge of protocells that forms the communal unit at the beginning of life because it can do network transmissions, just like a computer network, just like the internet. It can build up properties faster because everything's in connection and relationship. And that the, one of the properties that will emerge is memory. And we're now doing laboratory work around this where uh, we have short polymer templates which act to copy themselves, to do Watson Crick base pairing and copy other short templates. And so memory can arise as predicted within an interconnected set of protocells. So it needs probability shaping to get everything together, interconnection to have message passing, and then these templates could arise. So P I M. So in this vision one night, in my more mystical side of science, when I asked the question, what made us? This PIM formalism was presented, and the voice came was, there is nothing outside of this system. And then I started to think, well, what about a smartphone? What is, and, and then it occurred to me in a flash, that's a PIM device. It crowds things together into apps, to make them more likely to interact in terms of code. It uses interconnection network with other devices to grow in, it, in its complexity and it has memory. It restores, stores pictures and videos and phones, phone numbers and everything. 
So a smartphone is a PIM type device. That's why it's so powerful. And that all of human culture potentially is run on PIM. Uh, this Zoom meeting, for example, we're crowded together in Zoom. We're interacting, or at least when I shut up, we'll be able to interact more. And we're remembering what happened. We, we're making a recording in the cloud. So this is a PIM thing that's going on. And this is how culture advances. So it then came to me that everything is driven by this PIM cycle. <clears throat> so what if you could take a look back at the diagram. You've got this. So the origin of life happens. You get this cycling. And the cycling is driven by that wonderful orange ball there on the horizon, the sun. As the sun rises, it puts very high quality incident radiation or energy into the Earth's system, into the surficial system, and powers this PIM cycle. Most of life is dependent on uh, energy from the sun, pretty much. It's like very small percentile of life still can uh, is, is solely dependent on chemical energy. So every time the sun rises, it pulses the system. And this is what allows complexity to to emerge. So the PIM runs and you get this flat base of my, the microbial world. First the progeno world, then the microbial communities. And what came to me in the vision was this, this circling kind of whip tail uh, light bar that's going up around this almost like uh, crystalline or icicle like shape. And I realized that that is the stresses of evolution, of asteroid impacts, chemical changes, uh, driving and shaping life forward and forward and upward and upward in time. And this whip tail thing is the energy that's providing the ability for it to go away from equilibrium state and, and continue to add complexity. And initially it's all, it's, well, it's in fact all PIM because M is, the, is, in this case, the memory of genes and mainly epigenetic genetic memory. The I up here on the left is the interconnection between organisms. It's getting more dense and more nuanced, especially as you get neurons. And P is the probability uh, off of the back plane, off of four billion years ago when the Earth was just a self-assembled you know, exoplanet, all toxified and it would just wind down, you know, like Mars did. But Earth has is, is undergone this probabilistic shift that's four billion years in, in length now, in height. So what you'll see in the kind of little crystal there is bigger blobs. And those suggested to me big organisms, eukaryotic cells, fungi, uh, then plants and animals, all shaped on the top of this probabilistic tower. And around them, is this kind of funny internetworking thing going on. So the memory is initially genes, but then it becomes uh, memes. It becomes learning in the lifetime of an organism as neurons. Uh, neurons allow adaptation during the lifetime of an organism. And so this network, this I part of it gets denser and denser and denser. And then we sort of stop tracking the interconnects and we're looking at this little space as you get bigger and bigger and bigger animals you get mass extinction events and that culls out whole the dinosaurs etc but left the birds allowed the mammals to go forward and then this this kind of little thing here that that i drew was self-awareness the the beginnings of self-aware uh, systems self-aware where the animal could look at, at its reflection in in the water and recognize it as self and that was tens of millions of years ago, probably, for several species. But then, as soon as you start having self-awareness, especially around tool, tool making, as on the plains of Africa, you get this vast acceleration. And so I'm showing that as this more whip tailing up here that we're inside right now. This, we feel the cycling acceleration is just tremendous right now, heading toward this blowout event or this uh, blow uh, blow in event whatever it would be which is the union of all of this PIM stuff all this mechanistic stuff 
leading to complex brains that are able to, to not only conceive of technologies and invent things and do culture, but also to work out how we all began and the cosmos behind. So this awareness, so when you have these moments where you're looking at the, the background, you're looking at the Milky Way and you have this aha moment, and when your mind goes out and, and realizes that there's dust clouds and things and you go and you try to visualize this Milky Way like Carter Emmert does at the Hayden Planetarium when he takes you on tours of the universe, um, you come into this amazing uh, opening, this aha opening. And when you look back, this is what these little hoops are, and realize that we are standing on a, a probabilistic tower four billion years of unlikely events that happened, trillions of events that led to us. We're so rare in the cosmos. And you have that another aha moment. So for the size of the cosmos, for the rarity of us, for the beauty and complexity of the living world, you have these incredible openings. And I would put forward that they're more powerful than uh, a religious opening because religious openings often are very culturally specific. This one is about the totality of what is. You know, Ram Dass talked about just sort of being here now. Well, this is a geek, mystic scientist version of being here now and having a trip, basically, on what is. And so that's, in a sense when beings are reaching that star point, that blast off point of realization of, of the beauty and the complexity and perhaps somewhere in there is love, somewhere in there is the, is the complete opening of the heart, the mind, the, the totality of, of all uh, of the being itself, all your chakras perhaps, all of what made you up is involved in this. So a little side tale for you Albert Einstein, when he was working out uh, general and special relativity, um, I think the, the solution is he wrote about the solution for general relativity came through his body first. He'd been working the math for years. This is 1916 in Berlin. And he felt the solution come up through his body. He felt an excitement, a trill, and then he knew it was coming to him. And this has happened to me as well. So in some sense, what Einstein is, was pointing at is that, that the body is also involved. It's the total being that is involved. It's not just model making in the head. And when I get visionary downloads and Newton had visionary downloads and, you know, uh, Carrie Mullis and Einstein, and we just get stuff that comes from who knows where that comes into our cognition and provides solutions like this one. And so... That's the mystical boundary between science and, and the mystical, or the mechanical and the mystical, which is, is well used in science. It's not the norm. Most scientists are technicians. Most science scientists are doing empirical work, like lab work, or work we were doing in New Zealand. It's very meticulous, and, and, and you have to do it very precisely to uh, convince people. You have to show mechanics. But the visionary stuff, like this stuff, or the original uh, vision for the origin of life that Scientific American uh, published is from another space. So what I'm suggesting here, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, is that over time, human beings have reached this, this star point, this, this total realization, unity consciousness, unity realizations. They've, perhaps Buddha reached it. Um, when he had his enlightening, his, his awakening, just boom. He, he was unified with all. And I would suggest that many uh, sort of avatars throughout history have reached this point, but it's, they're reaching it so much more these days. Um, we have all the tools we need. We've spiritual tools, meditation tools, physical practices, dietary uh, regimens, uh, plant medicines, uh, laboratory elixirs. Uh, we, we have all these tools that can pop us into this state uh, more and more. And I think that more and more of us humans are, are entering into this state. <clears throat> and if you enter the state where you, you ask for the total awareness of the cosmos itself and the evolution of how we were made, 
you can get a really interesting unity awareness around this. Really interesting, because in a way, what we're seeing here is the very body of life. The root chakra, the creation down below with this PIM, with the pumping action, and then the central core body as, as body itself is made, coming up into as mind is made, and then as vision is made, and then as, in a sense, a crown or seven chakra or eight chakra thing is like, ping, the realization. So in our bodies, there's sort of a parallel between that and this. So the very body of life. Um, so uh, this is this is a new a new thing. It was rendered. I did the sketches uh, about a year ago, and uh, Ryan Norcus did the renderings, and uh, it it just I'm starting to talk about it because it it, it perhaps does unify uh, the mechanistic world as an underpinning or explanation for. Uh, but not a dumbing down of the awaken, awakened experience and the, some people call it non-dual, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that the spiritual experience can be un unwound and, and it must have a substrate to run on. You couldn't be standing on the earth in the time of that rock and have a spiritual experience just standing there because you'd expire very quickly because you need the entire living world to support your body. You need the, the microbiome. You need nutrition. You need sun. You need energy, vitamins, breathable air. You need all of that to exist. And you probably need the internetworking of, of all of other people and of civilization and of birds and of the hormones in the environment. You need all of that to support not only life, but your consciousness and perhaps your spiritual experience. So back at the bottom of this spire, ain't going to be that type of human spiritual experience happening. Uh, it has to, can only happen when there's a sufficient support for it. And why, why do we do this? You know, uh, why, why are we uh, doing this? I think because, you know, as you know, for several hundred years, there's been a kind of war between reductionist materialism and spiritism. And the war was fought for good reasons, because for several thousand years, I mean, people were burnt at the stake. Uh, all kinds of uh, reasons were given just from people's so-called spiritual experience. Millions died at the hands of, of uh, believers in God or one or another spirit. So in the Enlightenment, uh, they determined that it's that for civilization to move forward, they needed to have evidence and data and they needed to have grounding for technologies to be developed, for disease to be understood. We needed the mechanistic and we needed discipline around it. Uh, and yet it, for, for some people, it became in a sense a shackle in that the technical workers in fields tend to find that they're drained of uh, the ability to have insight or this is their energy. It's grinding work. Let's let's face it for technical work, and so the mystic scientist uh, comes in to provide inspiration and solutions, getting stuff from the field. And this is this tangled uh, web of things. I'm, I came up with a name for it: the field. Uh, and it's it's not God. It's not an individual spiritual experience. It's the operating system the OS that is the shaper of probability. And I'll conclude with this, this thought that this is a super OS. I started sensing it when I was about nine years old and decided to establish like a permanent link with this OS by the time I was 11 and 12, that it would guide my life. So it would guide where I walked on the street, what courses to take, what code to write, uh, what meetings to go to, because I had given the field the dream of solving the riddle of the origin of life. And I said, I'll follow every sign that you provide back. And for me, the field was not a human. It was a, a neutral kind of massive operating system that simply shaped reality. And I believe that I have a proposal here for how the field is made as a reality shaper, probability shaper rather, and, and a reality creator. 
So when I projected into the field when I was 14, I said, I dream of solving the, middle of, the riddle of the origin of life. It just started lining things up. And when I was 53 or 54, the solution came. Because I had followed every step, just like climbing this probabilistic spire. In my own life, I had followed every step toward that goal. And I reached that aha moment, that starburst at the top. I reached it when I was 53 years old. It was the, one of the greatest moments of my life. And I came out of that meditation and I saw the entire cycling pool and all the processes. And it was like this, this great moment. Uh, a, a spiritual moment, truly. And then the goal, of course, is to bring that insight back into the world, into the correct language and tech and explanations to make it real in the world. Otherwise, it can just spin into story, uh, which Gino talks about a lot, people being trapped in story. So if we can bring visionary insights into the world, test them and uh, make them useful, then they're not trapped as story, they're, they become technologies. So with that, um, and you know, the suggestion that this word, the field, is, is both a, a nerdy term, because there's fields in technology, and it's also a, um, a beautiful kind of artistic spiritual term too. So I'm proposing it as a new term for uh, this thing that we're all living in and it's getting denser and denser all the time in this time, especially through the networks we've built. The field is really strong and it can, it can make stuff happen better and better. It's, it's waking up in a way as a kind of meta-organism, uh, this field thing. Uh, so it could be the greatest tool we ever have as homo sapiens, is the intention into this field, the attention for uh, the objects that come from the field, the, the direction that comes. And then when we take action, we open up probabilistic valleys into outcomes. So that's kind of a, a spiritual technology, it could be used for any, anything. So I know that's been a long, a long wrap but uh, I want to thank uh, you for your attention, and I think we can we can go back to the gallery view again, and perhaps just uh, open it up for questions. I see that Gino raised his hand. I don't know if we want to. Yeah, Gino. Since I was pinging him throughout, he he gets <laughs> the first uh, slice of pie here. Thank you. Really, really wonderful. I haven't, uh, I think the last time I saw you was um, actually, your, I think your visit here. But um, just seeing this, I still remember our early conversations when you were using plant medicine to kind of guide your visions and your early, you know, I think Mother Ayahuasca or something brought you to see the origin of life. And you, I think you saw it and you experienced it, you know, your early descriptions of it. I think those things are recorded. Um, and then just really wonderful to see you kind of flesh that out. But the thing I'd like to add related to this a little bit, tied to your field and tied to your PIM, is FUSIS, which is nature. And so you probably remember, you know, I had this FUSICOI thing, which were the pre-Socratics, you know, the term, and then they were the ones that were investigating nature. And and I go back then because at that time in the early Greeks, 500 BC, it's when the uh, science, spirituality, and philosophy were essentially the same thing. And the ancient Greeks were very careful to distinguish between phusis, which are things that happen in nature, and techne that have gone through the filter of the mind. And so if a star in the heavens went supernova, they would say, oh, that's phusis. The star is acting of its own nature because no one ever touched that star and its action is because of its acting its true nature versus if most of you look around you, everything that you see is basically came from somebody's mind, someone's idea. And then related to this development, there's another person that kind of studied this and tried to develop a theory, which was this uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and his theory, you know, looking at yours as well too, was there was a geosphere and then the biosphere and atmosphere, and then the newosphere. And the newosphere is where our conversation's happening, right? You know, this conversation, and 
when you say story in my talk of story, it's everything that happens in this mental space. Now, if you think of this mental space right now, each new idea, including yours in theory, continues to expand the collective of everyone. And so if you think of the material world, it's just phusis, which is nature, and the collective intention of everyone that's ever existed acting upon uh, the, the techne, uh, their ideas and their intentions acting upon the material world. And so in a sense, the material world is kind of like Minecraft, you know, the language that we're using, all the technologies that we're using came from people before us. Now imagine for you where, where as you develop that first person that became self-aware. At that time, the newosphere, which right now I'm accessing with this language and where this conversation ha is happening, the first person that became self-aware, biblical Adam, if you will, takes a bite of the, the, for, from the forbidden fruit and develops knowledge, they actually, for him or her, and or her, the whole newosphere is just their experience. <laughs> And then came stories transmitted, and then came written language, and then became kind of this, this whole science and everything. And it continues to expand with each new fear and each new proof that continues to expand. Now, when you're born, you're basically just like biblical Adam, you know, all of us. And then what happens is we have to learn the structure that is a mix between phusis and techne, which is the collective intention and all the structures that everyone's created, all the laws, all the rules, all of the, all these things. But I would, so I know I'm kind of long winded around this, but uh, it, it follows along your development path nicely. But the only thing I'd like to add to it is that as you kind of do this inner work, it's kind of an unwinding and it's a accessing from this mental realm, other forms of knowing. And so for you, initially it was plant medicine and then we did our experiments at Burning Man and everything. <laughs> and then you were able to have this experience when you were 53 years old after the meditation and you saw it all too. And then now you're accessing more refined things that are beyond what, what, what consensus reality understands, right? And so you've kind of pushed to it, you've kind of beyond, but to go beyond, you went within, saw the revelations and then are bringing it out to kind of expand it collectively for everyone as well, you know, mm -hmm. which is exciting. And when you go past that singularity point of the inner work, and it's difficult, right? And so Galen, <laughs> all of the emotional things that go through in terms of letting go and finding your inner truth, finding your inner thesis, then allow you deeper insights. And, and, <laughs> and then the way that you do things is different. Now, some of the things coincidentally, some of the people that are online right now, and what we found is that when you get a lot of, with uh, Alexandro Pagedas, who's here, we did this thing called the Evolving Caravan. And with that, we found that when you get a lot of people that have done a lot of inner work traveling together, magic happens. Highly improbable things happen. And if you look, uh, Lumi's here as well, too. And last year, me and part of this caravan crew were in Egypt on camels in the desert. And then out of the blue, Lumi just shows up on a camel in the desert. We didn't even know he was in Egypt. So all of these kind of highly improbable things give you confidence to let you go deeper into, into the unknown, <laughs> into the mysteries, <laughs> to be able to do the Prometheus story, or the uh, yeah, Prometheus of going out, discovering the fire like you're doing, and then bringing it back to share with mankind so that we can move humanity further. And so... The, the point that I wanted to get across that is not only is there a PIM, but there are bigger forces at work. There is phusis and there's nature somehow. I know you've got it down as probability, which is the best way we can describe it across that everyone understands. But you, as you do this, you realize that nature does have a plan. You do have a role in this. And part of it is finding that role within you and living it. And so knowing it experientially and living it. And so with that, there's a lot of interesting things because, you know, you say it starts with water and then now water is also very interesting. And so people that are kind of on the fringes are discovering that water has structure. There's unstructured water and, and water then in the process that you're talking about too can guide things in very, very subtle ways that awareness then can pick up on and amplify. 
And that's all I have to say about it. But I just wanted to share this whole mental realm and how the memes and ideas here continue to expand from biblical Adam, which is an explosion just like your, your initial Big Bang. And that happens for everybody. Gino, thank you. I, I see a pathway forward for our work in the next phase. This is absolutely beautiful. More collaboration. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Do we have any more hands up? I see Carter is raising his physical hand. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This is really fascinating and interesting and really resonates on a lot of deeper levels. Um, so I had a spiritual awakening back in 2015 um, in the desert with some mushrooms, which led me to a teacher, a spiritual teacher who, um, his practice, is, he's a modern Orthodox Jew and an energy healer. And from him, I learned about the Kabbalistic tree of life, which the way I learned it is the energetic blueprint for the universe. And there's these 10 energy centers and they all are interconnected and communicate kind of like the PIM network. And it's how energy moves through the universe that from my understanding would eventually lead to the diagram you just showed us and explained to us. And the way I've worked with it more um, is what came through a visionary image to my teacher um, is working with it on the human body and how to activate one's Kabbalistic tree of life and go through and clear and work with it on an energetic healing level. And from that, you know, my third week working with my teacher, we had a 13 year old boy who came in uh, for a healing session. He had cancer in his left lung, in his liver cancer that moved into his left lung. By the end of the session, my teacher said, you know, I think we got it. The doctors ran more tests, did not find any cancer, and he was in remission. And I've had multiple people come in who have had lifelong allergies and been able to support them with doing the energy healing work. So to me, this becomes repeatable. And the questions that come up is, you know, a couple. One, how does this concept fit into your understanding, Bruce? And... Um, you know, for me, the other piece, I've done some studying of um, Nassim Haramin's work and Dr. George Yao, you know, who he is with uh, Pulsars, um, understanding uh, scalar waves and thinking about scalar waves. My theory is that they are the chi, prana, or shakina that is manifested into this physical world and being able to tap into and manipulate uh, the probability in the field. Yeah, um, I can give some experience on, because as Gino pointed out, doing the deep inner work opened me up to new ways of being and experiencing. And uh, in 2015, 14, 15, uh, I had finished my plant medicine work this long course of many years. I'd done really kind of as far as I could go at the time. And then suddenly when a person showed up here at the house uh, named Annalisa Delberg and uh, with another fellow named Chris Catterton who also was on Gino's uh, early road tour. And I felt her field. I felt the power that she had and she had formed a group called Luminous Awareness Institute. And I joined it. I actually went for a demo of what Annalisa was talking about, bringing up this field amongst people and then non-locally, uh, basically communicating with the little wounded parts that are inside each of us, the little children that are shaped by early childhood experience, communicating with them non-verbally, energetically, and I saw Annalisa within an hour, you know, taking uh, random people that showed, showed up for this circle, uh, taking them through a shamanic healing that I nominally would only see in the plant medicines. So I felt, okay, this is time to uh, 
kind of go. That's my next level. And I've been in Luminous now for five years. I'm training as a practitioner, uh, which means doing at least a thousand sessions because you have to learn to attune to external systems, internal systems, all the parts, the parts that create the human operating system. It's kind of Akashic work, actually. There's all because there's lineage involved, because there's deep memory and deep effects that go back generations. That's the Akashic field, uh, one explanation for it. So we're doing lineage work. We're doing, we're doing all of it. And in fact, the program runs for two years. We have 65 students at a shot that we all meet. We're now meeting on Zoom, but we meet uh, every four, three months and undergo these four to five day sessions of incredible rolling through the healing very, very rapidly. So uh, the next session we're supposedly taking up is about wounds in the heart, about not getting enough uh, love when there's an infant to about five years old. And that can create something called the masochist uh, response, uh, which is, I'm an idol and no one sees me. So they, they can't let love in because they don't believe in it, because uh, it just never was there. It was never reliable or it came with conditions. And so what, what I've been able to, to witness and now practice is all the things that I used to think of as woo, or even woo or woo, 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 you know, woo, woo triplicate. And it's very scientific. So I watch as our group with 65 students and 35 practitioners, we work together and it's an incredible dance. It's a field itself. It's an energetic field that can actually pick you up and walk you across the room to get you into the right position. If you're open to, it, to that, you can actually be operated by this thing like a string puppet. <laughs> and we just kind of do it. We're used to it. We're used to this non-local sensing of energy, talking to parts, people feeling when I do something, and my practice is called realm bending, and where I can have a sense inside where I touch the inside, the energetic field of another, and it will bump them. They'll feel it physically. And Gino and I did this practice uh, up on the peak, up on the top of uh, uh, above Hong Kong when I was there. It was the most magical day I'll never forget. We did this sharing, we did this communication, non-verbally, for the most part, the seeing of little beings inside. And Luminous is super refined. I mean, there's hundreds of practices involved. We, we use Tibetan Dzogchen Buddhism, we use Qigong for energy, we use, you name it, they bring it in. It's not one practice, it's hundreds, depending on what's needed in the moment for this large group. And because it's a large group, there's huge resources. So in order to bridge what is a repeatable uh, practice into science, uh, I've put together Luminous with the IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences, where I've been doing more work. I've been, I, did, I was their opening keynote for their conference last year here in Santa Clara, and I'm advising and helping them with their donors and advising them. Uh, to some extent, and we have the board chair of IONS who's going through the Luminous program so that she can experience this because with IONS, it exists. It was, it was, it's an institute here in Northern California. It was founded by Edgar Mitchell in 1974. And Ed Mitchell, on the way back from the moon, uh, from his mission, which was Apollo 14, he was uh, command, I think he was commander of the, the lunar module. He was coming back and they were kind of off break. They'd landed on the moon, they were returning. And Ed Mitchell was looking out the window on the command and service module. And NASA had started to rotate. They had them rotate it so that the, the heating from the sun would be distributed. And he had time off. He had time off to, in a sense, meditate what just had happened. And, and he saw, like, the galaxy going by. Like, because in space, in between Earth and Moon, especially when you're, the Moon isn't in full light and the Earth is in darkness, you can see a lot. That's the best star viewing you would ever see in your life. Because the only point source of light is the Sun. So he was seeing, like, the biggest, the best view of the universe a human has ever seen with his naked eye. And so the, the galaxy or part of the galaxy would be going past part of the Milky Way 
And he had this realization, which was a very geeky realization, which was that every, every molecule and, and atom in my body was made by those uh, stellar furnaces that I'm seeing. And suddenly he had an opening of connection between his body and his being and all of that which was out there. And it created what was later described by others as a, the, a samadhi in space, a, 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 a huge opening. And there's actually a videotape of Ed Mitchell. You can see it online of him with this big shit eating grin on his face. And it's during the return version uh, voyage. And that was after his Samadhi experience, which he didn't even know anything about what Samadhi meant. He looked, he, he looked up a friend in Houston and, and to describe what he had experienced. Common in human spiritual practice, but experienced by a geeky astronaut and Air Force guy, test pilot, the whole thing. And it led him to ask the question of, what is that? And so he formed IONS, Institute of Noetic Science. And so IONS exists at the boundary of parapsychological effects like remote viewing, twin studies, where the twins have the same experience at the same time, action at a distance, and they have four research programs. And what I'm doing in the slow evolution through bringing of, of luminous people together with IONS people is like, hey, you could put you could put a luminous practitioner and a, a student in different rooms and they could bump each other energetically and they could read the systems. And we can do this over and over again because that's the training we get. And it's sort of a little bit like the old Star Wars Jedi work, right? These are not the droids you're looking for. You know? <laughs> all the sort of stuff, you know, the force or whatever that we all think of as fantasy but it's now not only in Luminous, but many practices, this is becoming a technology. And just like electricity in the 19th century, we didn't know about electrons. We didn't know how it worked. We just used it. And so we have something that is non-local, goes from system to system, that's extremely refined and getting more refined, that is a technology. And so my hope, and, and because the coronavirus pandemic we had to skip the donors meeting and I was gonna be presenting this as a mission for the donors of IONS uh, in March uh, at a special day to try to open a fifth research channel in this very area where IONS can take these kinds of risks. And IONS has full on trained scientists who do laboratory work, you know, double blind and everything. And that we could actually, and the founder of of Illuminous, Annalisa, wants to systematize and study what they've worked out as a practice. So we can actually study this as technology um, in the healing arts. And then it would get gain wider acceptance and we'd even learn. We'd even have, we'd have laboratories as a result. We, we could do laboratory testing of creating energetic tools, insights and methods and holdings of awareness and trying them out, one to the other, one to the other, trying them out in group, like Mikey Siegel has done, someone else who worked with Gino. Michael C Mikey Siegel has done with his heart sync, which has all led to the trans tech and consciousness hacking movement. So there's a lot of juice here. There's a lot of things that can, can merge what we nominally would have called spiritual or experiential with tech, with science, uh, with awakening, with all these things, it's, it's, this is a golden age. This is like the most amazing time in human history. And we're talking about it all over the world on this platform and we can make it real. So I would say to you, Carter, that this is the golden age. And what we have to be cautious about uh, is what we can do is strip a lot of the story out and see what happens. So for example, uh, an experience that happens to you, human beings generally will interpret it in some kind of cultural framework or story and create a whole complex description of things. And in religion, that becomes codas and Bibles, and it becomes a huge meta structure, which actually is effective to some degree, but then people spend more attention on the story than the actual experience. And after two or three generations, 
it's only the story is left. So we have to always come back to is what, what Terence McKenna talked about, which is the felt experience, the direct experience without, uh, without the huge architecture and artifice of story and explanation. So we can kind of say, let's just go back to experience. Let's Let's not get too far from it. Let's not let's not spin it out too much because then it'll become story or uh, frameworks. And so at Luminous, we actually we're always using funny languages, uh, funny language, and joking around so that it doesn't become too serious. We we can use a cultural metaphor like the Akashic field or stuff from Buddhism. We use that, but then we say, okay, that's just a that's just language around it. It's not what it is. What it is could be completely nonverbal, completely in the body, not even accessible with words, not describable with words. Most psychedelic experiences are not Englishable. As Terence used to say, they're not Englishable. And I used to comment to him, yes, but they are Irishable, which is, of course, Terence uh, is an, an Irish tale teller. Uh, but with that, I think I've, 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 I've Irished this uh, long enough, so perhaps we should go to the next hand that's up. I think Robert has had his hand up. Yeah. And then um, I also see a few more after, David and Michael. So. Yes, uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, this is my first time uh, you know, hearing uh, about uh, your, uh, your work. I was more familiar with you from uh, micro uh, computer days uh, than, than, than this. I only found out about your interest in this in the past few months. A uh, couple of clarifications. Uh, your uh, PIM seems to uh, be very reminiscent to me of uh, Prigogine's dissipative structures. Is, is that essentially where you're coming from with that? Yeah, definitely a derivative okay. of that, that insight. Okay, and also I think I got the impression that you're thinking of consciousness as an emergent property of, of, of our physicality. Is is that correct? Yeah, that's that's my uh, gearhead. Uh, okay, then satisfaction uh, level with that. You also mentioned uh, you know having received some of these downloads, as you call them. Um, from where do they come uh, if you know consciousness is an emergent property from underneath? Uh, so worry. I mean, maybe it's just the you know the the, the poor wording that we have, uh, the uh, non-Englishable, as you were just saying, uh, you know, concepts that we have to deal with. Uh, but uh, where? Are you saying that this, uh, the field, which, you know, Lynn McTaggart wrote a whole book on the field. There's uh, Laszlo's, you know, work on calling it the Akashic field, whether, I mean, we can argue about the meaning of, 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 of the field uh, forever, I guess. But uh, with the general concept, uh, it seems to me a more conventional uh, psycholog and I'm a psychologist by, by profession, so a more conventional psychological explanation is that you know, your unconscious mind does wonderful things when you're not paying attention. Uh, and, I mean, from Kekulé's discovery of the benzene ring from a dream and, and, and all that, uh, why not, when you call it a download, are you saying this is coming from somewhere else? Or are you saying it comes from you're unconscious because you've been studying this for years. You've been absorbing it. You've been thinking about it. Haven't quite put it together, but when you let go, uh, you get a download uh, that your unconscious has put together. Or are you saying this is something external uh, from the field in a sense? Uh, the other, one other point is, um, I think, Gino, you, know, you um, made a, a point about when we're born, uh, we're that uh, that one point, uh, and we have to to learn. But I think there's sufficient evidence uh, in Stevenson's book on uh, uh, 20 cases uh, uh, supporting reincarnation and other information that uh, 
people have access uh, you know, to information that they shouldn't have access to, that they could not have learned except through whatever this field, you know, these field properties may have. Uh, so there's something, there seems to be something uh, more so than what we are. And if that's what you're calling the field, okay, I guess we can call it that. Uh, okay, I made my comments. I'd like to hear yours. So I, as you were making your very cogent comments, and I really appreciate the psychologist as engineer approach to this, asking the, the mechanistic questions, I had a picture in my mind of Alexander Graham Bell uh, in his first use of the telephone uh, was to call his assistant to come to him. And that was the first thing supposedly stated on the telephone. And at the time, uh, they didn't understand the mechanics of electricity and electron shells and things like this, but they were using it. And then fast forward to uh, when we start and others have started to do the experiment of having two people in isolation reading their systems or somehow influencing them and then feeling each other in a bump like we can do it luminous just at will. And it's like, Watson, come here, I need you in the 21st century. So then we ask the question of, well, if we did a simple thing and we, we had a high fidelity result, what the heck is the transmission medium? So that, that could be question number one. Is there an etheric field back from the 19th century? Is there something going on? And what are the physical mechanisms of this? And of course, Penrose and, and Hemeroff are hammering away at this, uh, trying to find quantum level things. And we now know that, you know, quantum effects, my, my neighbor here, Nick Herbert, uh, did an important proof of John Bell's theorem uh, in the 1970s and worked with John Bell. And that's all about action at a distance. Um, and that's what Penrose and Hamroff are working on in terms of microtubules and things in the brain, maybe that the brain can wobble. I, I worked with Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona for seven years. And I mean, he did some of that very early research of you know, people isolated in different rooms and being able to, to sense and match uh, you know, various physiological parameters. Uh, and he's doing some, uh, we, <laughs> we were the synchronicity twins. Uh, we could all, always, I would make a statement and I would hear Gary say something like, so when was the last time you, whatever it was, or how many times a week or a month, or have you ever done or said such a thing because we felt that connection between us and it happened so frequently. And he's written several volumes on, on synchronicity. Mm, gotcha. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, I, I don't know, there, there, there seems, you know, I, I, I kind of like Alan Watts's, uh, uh, human beings are the universe's way of observing itself, you know, uh, as a, uh, but that seems to imply, you know, uh, the consciousness uh, prior to, you know, the, uh, the, the chain that, that, that you described, uh, that uh, uh, it's more of a panpsychist view. You said you weren't a, a hard panpsychist. Does that apply you're a soft panpsychist? Well, it, it all met in, in a sense, perhaps I'm, a, I'm the, the the poster, a poster child, or maybe the the whipping post, ultimately, for some, of trying to do this thing, trying to meet all of it in one place. Uh, well, giving you the example of, in order to have the, uh, Gino referenced this uh, earlier in his comments, to obtain the mechanistic explanation for how life could have began, I had to undergo. A, a substantial process of the stripping down of my own consciousness, my thinking mind, completely shut down, uh, a very powerful medicine which had as a component DMT. Then I had learned for years how to flush endogenous DMT into something I call an endotrip, which I was doing when I was a little kid, and I think perhaps all little kids do this. 
and when you are going to sleep as a child and and you've had an exciting or stimulating day and you close your eyes and you see all this color behind closed eyelids i used to dial my consciousness back so that the color things resolved into images like television looked like tv and uh that became a, a portal for me when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I drew all these worlds out. And then only about seven or eight years ago, I did A-B comparison experiments with some of the medicine ayahuasca, but extremely small amounts. Uh, and when the, that medicine started to affect me after two hours, because it was so little, I was using the monooxy. Uh, MAOI inhibitor to help my system to flush my own DMT. So then I would literally turn a, a, a valve on that would flush DMT into my system that I'd learned how to do. And it would then create this, uh, this new experience. It would open tremendous portals because I wasn't dependent upon the, the molecule from, uh, from the medicine. There wasn't enough of it in, in there. I was actually driving my own system. But I had to do all these other practices at the same time in order for that to work, really turning off cognition altogether mm -hmm. and uh, turning heightened sensing way up for all of these, uh, as you probably were doing, Robert, all these uh, awareness of stuff coming into the field, guiding you as to what to do next. And it was only through that portal it was only through that portal that my consciousness was able to obtain, to, to go back the four billion years, metaphorically, and to dissolve and become, there's a wonderful mosquito here reminding me to finish up, uh, to then become it, become that solution. And very much in a kind of in a spiritual way. And then during this moment when I saw the molecular machine that was enabling the first cell division, which is really where life can start when cells learn to divide, that I got the mechanistic explanation, but at the same time felt an intelligence behind my entire experience. So it's a conundrum. It's a conundrum, but perhaps uh, a, a word, a phrase came always comes to me in these extremely elevated states, which is, you can't know it, but you can become it. And the, the only way of, of understanding is to fully become the, the, the question. And it's beyond uh, the kind of blueprint forming, cartoon drawing, uh, human monkey brain. Uh, some of these things are just beyond. And, and yet, I still am enough of a gearhead that I wanted to bring all that insight back and come to a model that was testable in chemistry and in biophysics, uh, membrane biophysics, and because then it can land. So to your, to your question, I'm still pretty much a hard materialist and believe that much of our experience is generated by the living world because I think it's, it behooves us to pay attention to the living world. I do hold out that there is something greater, uh, but that it's, I still, my hypothesis is it's made by the interactions of these trillions and trillions and trillions of mechanistic polymeric processes at the lowest level stacking and stacking and stacking. And that if you went out into the cosmos, into a star formation cloud, or you went to Mars, you'll find complexity so low that Mars doesn't change. In three billion years, the surface of Mars has not changed. There's areas that are, it's mummified. And it, it, it goes, in a sense, uh, against my grain of, of everything I've, I can see and know that complex properties must have a complex substrate to run on. And that in other places in the universe, there just isn't this complexity. Uh, and the last point, perhaps, this is this hypothesis as well, that P, that probabilistic tower, if you see how tall that tower is, four billion years, and the events that had to happen in the order that they happened, if we're sitting up here, consider it almost like an energy potential, like Newton or 
other early scientists putting a ball on a ramp and watching it roll down and computing the energy that was stored in that ball potential that was then expressed by uh, running down the ramp through gravity. I believe that there's a potential, uh, probabilistic potential energy that in this complexity that we're stacked up here, in this Akashic-like super interconnected net of being that is just driving, that that thing, that intersection of that thing, plus all the memory, plus all the read-writes that are going on, that's a powerful enough system not only to generate uh, human experience that seems very trippy and, and alien, that's a freaking powerful system. That system is, is so mathematically powerful that it can generate even much more than our entire cultural load of spiritual experience, that there's so much more to come, but that it really is, it, it, the hypothesis is that it is that potential interconnection and the, the load of memory and the rapidity and the, the amount of cycling within cycling that's generating resonant patterning. Perhaps this is the transmission mechanism. And this is a new thought from last month. If you have, there's a famous story and then I'll let others ask, ask questions. Um, so Dick Feynman, uh, who's a physicist at Caltech, used to come to our group at University of Southern California. And I got really interested in, in this guy. I was terrified to ever ask the man a question because he's such a genius. There was a book written about him where uh, the legend of Dick Feynman, Richard Feynman, he goes down to the Savannah River plant during World War II, and he's part of the Los Alamos project at the time. And there are there's this whole room full of centrifuges, and they're making, I guess, this yellow cake stuff. You know, somebody in the business can correct me, but they're actually trying to refine uranium, and they're going around and going around and going around. And Feynman doesn't know anything about mechanics of this. He's just supposedly some kid from Los Alamos that's supposed to go and review the plant. So they unfold the the blueprints for the plant, and he randomly, he claims that he randomly put his finger in one spot, one spot on this blueprint showing these centrifuges, and the engineers go crazy. They There's all this noise in the room, etc. What he did, done is you know, accidentally pointed out that that in between centrifuges, if, if they're getting more and more refined yellow cake or, or fuel, that if you have clumps of them coming together, they're going to go critical across the distance between the centrifuges and start putting out dangerous particles and radiation into, which was happening at the Savannah River plant. It was happening. Their Geiger counters were just doing this kind of thing all the time. And then he'd identified that. And that metaphor came to me in that we're trying to figure out the first metabolic, energy-driven metabolic cycles within protocells. But because we have protocells together in a clump, maybe thousands of them, if the metabolic cycles start kicking in, is it possible that there can be resonance between cycles, kind of in this way, that's a non-local coupling? That that is the field. That that is the field. And that everything because there's so much cycling that's driven by energy, mitochondria making ATP is a massive cycling machine that is going and spinning and turning and turning and turning. What about the interst interstices between cycling systems? What about communication and resonance there? Could that be the, the because that's universal, that is ubiquitous across all life at all scales. What about studying that? Is that generating the non-local stuff? An action at a distance. I, I'd like to, to send you, uh, my mentor was Duncan Blewett, who, who did some of the original research with uh, treatment of alcoholism with LSD back in the 50s up in Saskatchewan. And uh, I have his unpublished manuscript uh, called uh, Psych about psychotronic engineering, as he called it, which has a lot to do with the field effect and resonance uh, theory in terms of human interaction at, at the very highest level while you were talking about it at a lower level. I think you'd, you'd be interested in it. I will, I will send you a copy. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And so I don't monopolize the whole bloody uh, field. Uh, who, who had their hand up next, Shenton? Um, I see two people. I know David Swedlow, 
in the chat and then Michael Gosney is holding up his fiscal hand. So maybe we can do David and then Michael and then I see Anita as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'll just, I'll, um, <laughs> I'm tempting to go along. This is a fascinating conversation and I love it very much. I, I think of the, the substrate question and, and there's an interesting, it, I have some, my own kind of insights and downloads that have happened related to that. Um, I'll, I'll share just kind of a couple of chains and then let that go. Um, Cause I don't, I don't think it's um, going to be the case that we're all going to come to the same answer. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is that the, the thought that I might, that we, that we can be on the same page is, uh, is a funny kind of a thing. And I think that's kind of an accident of history that we're, we find ourselves having been in a place where we could just essentially be on the same page. Um, the thought that came up, there's an insight, one of the insights that came to me was um, the notion of Helen Keller. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the practice of circling. Um, it's getting a little more publicity now with um, um, John Verveke is talking to Guy Singstock and so circling is just a relational practice. But during my training with, with circling, um, an image of Helen Keller came to mind just suddenly and I thought, oh, it's really interesting that, that Helen effectively was able to live in the world without language, but then acquired language and was able to, to see so much more. And the capacity of her ability to, to hold complex ideas was severely limited and then suddenly opened up to an extreme, to the full volume of what we have. And my thought was, oh, we're doing, we're at the same precipice for collective intelligence. We haven't yet learned how to speak in a language that allows us to perceive at the collective level so that the kinds of insights and downloads that you're having and that Dean Radin had and that you know the people at IONS had are, are just at the precipice where we're gonna be able to work on that exponentially with be, being able to develop a language and to be able to speak with the collective and in fact, possibly being able to read and write the, um, the Akashic records more, more, more directly. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting notion, but the, the thought of that, that, they, that kind of um, ability to perceive that seems, seems radical and like uh, even almost like, that, is that even possible? But this is where I think that the fact that we have kind of been thinking, the reason that we have lost the capacity, I think that people used to have a better capacity to indigenous peoples to, to effectively read the patterns more, more um, deeply about what's going on. And that in effect, um, the field worked with us to develop an individual thought to allow the formation of science and very precise, preci precision kinds of language and measuring tools, mathematics, in order to be able to see more deeply into the cosmos. But it required a kind of forgetting of our natural connection to that. So in a way, human species from, from the, in, at the beginning of tools and language kind of entered a sort of um, autistic Helen Keller moment that's lasted up until the present moment. And we're now beginning to be able to see past that, that as the ecosystem and the biosystem starts to say, okay, that's it. That's, we've, got what, we've got what we need. You've got what you need. Now it's time to flip back into resonance with the biofield. Um, and, and let's continue from that point on into the, into the future. And it's a very interesting, it's a, it's a, it's a compelling kind of a thing, but it doesn't necessarily require that, um, intelligence comes from a, a base point. It's, you know, in a way panpsychism can work with the particle level as well. I mean, there's a sense that the galaxy is, it just does, just as, um, uh, um, the, the, the astronaut, yeah, I'm blanking on the name, but just as he perceived, there's something in that it, that is pulling together the resources to allow these happy accidents to continue to happen. And the insights that come pouring through feel like um, once, I, once I see them, and just as you said, there's a kind of a surrender to listening to that and say, I will follow the trail that you show me mm -hmm. for this question. And mm -hmm. as I listen to it, it's like, oh, it, come, it comes and reiterates more and more. It's like, 
oh, it's been shouting at me this whole time and I've been kind of pushing it off for so long. And now that I'm actually tuned in and listening, it comes in very clearly. So I don't, like I said, I don't suspect that all of us on the call will have the same tuner set, but learning how, oh, my tuner set to this frequency, yours is set to that frequency, just as you said, kind of come together in these calls, that is where the magic happens. Oh, the cellular um, silo of my particular refinement of, of thought patterns and the cellular refinement of your particular silo of thought patterns blends together in this really interesting, we purified notions that then can create interesting mole molecules of higher order thought. So that's just kind of the thought as I'm thinking about this, that, that's really stirring up in me, um, but appreciate the call very much. David, that's just, that's extraordinary. If you could capture those words on some writing and share it, uh, that's an extraordinarily prescient, crisp view uh, of this, the tuning view. And I really want to thank you for bringing it in. You know, we all could collectively write uh, something about this. Uh, and thank you again. That just, that's just sort of blown my mind uh, in a new way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm actually working on a book right now. Um, the, the basic, I, the, the title, the working title is um, Sacred Roots Re-Membering, Remembering Trust as a Technology. So there's really understanding the, t the being, ability to trust that message enough to actually listen to it is, is, uh, is yeah. kind of the message that's been coming through. So thank you. Facilitator, can uh, James Nusa get in the queue? Thank you, Everett. This is a mind-blowing conversation, but uh, I'm on a phone, not the computer. So if I can get in the queue for a question or a take, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just checking in with you, Bruce, I know that our past salons have been a little bit more conversational. Um, did you want to get through the next three people who raised their hands and then maybe get into more of that format? Yeah, I think it's super juicy and um... We're, we're gathering some really important uh, insights here. So um, I'm going to hold my responses to less than a minute. How about that? <laughs> All right, then the next person in line was Michael. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Boy, it's great to be here. And <clears throat> Bruce, thanks for the invitation. And I'm so sorry I, I, I missed your presentation, but I look forward to watching it on the video. Um, I wanted to reference, I think I mentioned to you before, uh, Paolo Soleri, the uh, architect uh, who really picked up on a lot of Tehard's thinking. Um, I really think you would get some juice from his, his works, uh, particularly his look at the trajectory of evolution along complexity, miniaturization, and duration, looking at that that's like the trajectory, more complex miniaturized systems evolving through time. But um, I wanted to just bring everyone's attention to um, the current work of the HeartMath Institute. Uh, they've taken over uh, also, in addition to all of their work, uh, they've taken over the Global Consciousness Project, the random number system uh, that Dean Radin and Roger Nelson put together 20 years ago. And that is a fascinating uh, realm to really just, just study. And I, I'm wondering, you know, Bruce, how much or others on the call have looked at that technology. Um, but um, we are involved in a collaboration. I'm going to put it in the text, uh, a monthly uh, global meditation called Global Coherence Pulse, where the uh, participants are basically putting coherence into the field. And uh, and we're the different groups, uh, IONS is involved. And I was thinking, Bruce, maybe uh, each of the partners is taking a month to do a presentation. And uh, the last one, we've done two of them so far, and the videos are up on the website there. And the second one uh, had a wonderful presentation by Roland McCready, who's the lead scientist there on all of their work that's um, really great to take a look at. And, Part of what this involves is those participants who want to use the HeartMath app uh, and the sensor that you can get uh, to put on your finger to read your own state and bring yourself into heart coherence during the meditation and everyone can see themselves. So it's like an extension of what Mikey Siegel did 
originally out at Burning Man, which led to the whole consciousness hacking and all. But I, I just invite everybody to look at that. And Bruce, you might want to, I don't know if you've met Rollin, but he's a neighbor over there in Boulder yeah. Creek. So, um, yeah, just thank, to that. thank you. Thank you, Gaz. All right, next up was Anita. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi. Okay, great. Um, I kind of have a, a baby steps question, Bruce. At the beginning of the, at the bottom of the, um, the image, uh, where all the little connections are being made uh, and they're becoming more and more complex, somehow consciousness and memory slip in there but how does that happen because it's so not mechanical it's not you know molecules or um polymers i mean it's kind of a a question that uh i've wondered about since high school actually uh mostly because my father was from india and Although he wasn't a practicing Hindu, he was very preoccupied with where God comes in, what makes us alive. And I still can't really figure that out, even with your explanation. So from what I hear from what you're saying, memory is part of it, uh, but then consciousness slips in, and I'm not really sure how I can understand that in a mechanistic way. So here's a... An, an interesting uh, test of the theory of consciousness. Uh, Stuart Hameroff uh, at the university uh, that Robert uh, also worked at uh, was a, is an, a, an anesthetologist or anesthetologist studying anesthetics. And because he realized that he could give you a very, very small substance injected or however, and take your consciousness away, like very rapidly and very reliably his question was well what is the basis of consciousness if i can take it away with this molecule or i can enhance it with this other molecule isn't it molecular and so that led him to establish the science of consciousness conference 26 27 years ago to ask this question from a mechanistic point of view so at some level yeah i mean consciousness that the way primates experience it is very malleable. It's very mechanical. It's very dependent upon uh, biochemistry. And so in a way, I think it's all, it's everything, but it's more than, so it goes back to the old adage, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So if you have a lot of parts that start interacting, they create phenomena that are greater than the individual divisible parts. And that can happen in, in games, in chess. You know, the number of moves and the number of pieces that do certain moves create something so complex that it challenged the human mind for 2,000 years and challenged computers. And so that's called an emergent property. And so in a way, if you, if you actually consider all the parts that make up the human brain and the human society and the pheromones and the microbial system and the body and culture coming in, that's a lot of parts. That's a lot of divisible parts all in interaction. And I think that that is powerful enough to create a sum that is immense, just immense. Uh, that the fact that there are so many interacting parts down to the molecular level and it manifests for us as what something we might call conscious awareness, but of course it's conscious awareness of an athlete in a flow state is different than one of somebody answering a text. You know, what is conscious awareness? And then awareness of greater things is, as, uh, as I pointed out by David, the access point is different based on our filters and our training and our tools and our, our tuning knobs. So in a sense, it's difficult to use a simplistic word like consciousness or awareness or a spiritual state to describe something so complex that is the sum of so many parts. And perhaps why uh, your father was so fascinated, probably spent a lifetime pondering this, 
is because it takes more than a lifetime. You can ponder this for all lifetimes. All people can continue to ponder this and come up with different reflections off the fractal of what this is because there's so many parts that they sum up to something so large and so emergent. And uh, we will swim in this intellectually and experientially for our entire future history. Mm, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are so many more questions, but uh, it's a good start. I like what you said about the anesthetician. Anesthet I'm not even sure what the word is for that medical profession, but um, yeah, if he said, how come a molecule can make consciousness stop? That's, that's actually a super, super good question and um, has a lot of answers. Uh, what I was just, um, where my mind went to when you were talking about the sum being greater than the, the whole being the great, bigger than the sum of the parts, was in fact, um, if you take a painting and you uh, look at it closely, you see a, a collection of, of brush strokes. When you look back, you see a picture. Um, and that picture is something else in the collection of brush, brush strokes. But uh, I'm still struggling a little bit about the mechanistic, suddenly jumping over to something non-mechanistic. But uh, I'll sit on that. Thank you, Anita. Very good question. Right. Up next, I think it was James on the phone. Am I here? Am I here? Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Three. We can hear you. All right. So um, I'm going to keep it super brief because you guys are probably um, nearing the end of this broadcast. Uh, participatory experience. Um, what I will offer and what is kind of my, um, well, I honed it, man. I came up in the Bay Area. Uh, I traveled with the CIS uh, crew, the IONS crew, the Eflin crew, the Burning Man crew. Uh, and it was like pretty much my PhD, self-directed PhD uh, on social change in my life, at least that's the way I tell the story to myself. Uh, I'm, I feel like I'm in the pantheon of a lot of brilliant minds. Uh, I'm just going to give a shout out to Bruce and, and uh, Gino. You guys have been on my path and guided me. I always feel like a kid in this world. It's weird. I'm almost 50 years old, but I always feel like a kid in this world. Um, always learning. Um, and I just want to offer up into the field, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting clearer that I'm a creative or an artist or call it what you will. There's a lot of talk about, you know, science and stuff like that. Like, love it. Guided by spirit. Um, and, uh, in the invitation, I'm just going to leave a leave down to a lot of people that I respect uh, is a Burning Man aligned experience for the multiverse. Uh, I'm pulling the fucking stars out of the universe for this one. It's called the universe exploding. But everybody that I most respect in the world, I'm just calling them in and say like, hey, what do you want to do? What's your best special sauce to bring to the universe right now? And it's, it's, a, it's a dream with a deadline. You know, we've got four months to, like, bring it together. And the biggest dream container I could think of was this theme of the universe exploding. Um, so y'all are invited to, like, be your best selves, create your best dreams. Um, I'm putting the team together to, like, just express that shit and kind of, like, Big Bang Reverberation 2. Um, in 2020, you know, 8 billion years of R&D, what can we do with this consciousness that we have? Um, thank thank, I'll leave you, it, for, thank I'll leave, you for that. I'll leave yeah. it there. Yeah. 
you can't text a link in the the thing, but uh, send a, an email to the group. Yeah, no, it's it's stealthy right now. Like it doesn't exist in the world yet. It's 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 a collective consciousness that's expanding very rapidly. But I'll 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 find a way to like share a connection point with everybody. And again, deep bow uh, for all of your paths and all what you represent, like this is informational. Um, and one of my gifts is broadcasting um, consciousness, creativity, possible futures. And so if I can like just work craft that I've been well endowed with, like happy to serve. Um, Special Forces is showing up on your call, Bruce. And we're well trained. Thank you, James. I think I might have seen Larry put his hand up earlier. You're muted if you did there's, intend to. Oh, there's Larry. I really, I'm going to dumb it down a little. Um, my first observation when I saw uh, your diagram, your illustration, was there's no way you could have drawn this, thought of this, without being a Lord of the Rings fan. I mean, it just exploded Lord of the Rings in my head. That was my first, and before that subsided, uh, it was how, I don't know how aware you are of Marcel Duchamp and his large glass, and which was one of the most major influences on modern art in the 20th century. He's one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And there are so many elements that he had, just visual elements, that he had in the large glass uh, that were there that it was mind boggling. And Charles reacted the same way. I mean, he texted me and it's like, you know, what? And I just want you to know that I, I don't really know what to say except that it was really real. It blew my mind. So. Wow. Thank you, Larry. That's you no know Duchamp's work. I don't. And uh, yeah. part of part of these salons is that I can be in the looking glass and uh, start to get a little bit more. I, I've been a monk for about 20 years on this. I've been doing everything from first principles and now discovering there's all this beautiful uh, prior and current work. And it's my next 20 years is to ab absorb and network in uh, all this previous work. And in fact, the book that I'll produce will be of great, uh, greatly assisted by you all and all of these pointers, because it, it can, this is, this is uh, the silver spire that you saw is perhaps it is, there is an archetypal uh, representation throughout art and science and philosophy that's similar. So it, it could be grounded in the literature, as we say in, in uh, scientific publications, more grounded. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. We have, uh, we're at 8.49. I think we can go another 10 minutes or so and we'll hit our two hour mark. Uh, but this has been just one of the best levity salons yet so let's uh let's keep on cranking do we have any other anybody in the text has uh, or any uh, other uh questioners or commenters i see i see gino is raising his hand hey related to this let me just uh, throw in there again bruce really really happy to see all of this work and coming together is i just wanted to remind especially when there was an earlier question about uh kind of the field and everything is um, our Burning Man experience. I know in Levity Zone, you kind of talked about that early on in, but um, you know, we, we had done this experiment where um, we kind of brought ourselves to presence. And it seems like for you, every iteration of the machine, every question that you throw and every intention that you do is a response from the universe. And when, I, I don't know if you remember, but when we got into a certain state, we'd have conversations 
And it was almost like the universe would participate in those conversations as well. I, I don't know if you remember that experience and everything. Um, yeah, uh, maybe to uh, give you- With that, hold on, yeah, with, yeah, go with ahead. Qigong and everything, and the big thing about this and the big challenge is there's a difference between knowing something conceptually and experientially. And there's a refinement of physiology that then gives you access to these other forms of knowing and everything as well. Yeah, uh, Gino's practice is absolutely remarkable and absolutely simple. And I, I should bring that to you as a experience here of this practice. So we're at Burning Man, I think it was gosh, 2014 or something like that. And Gino's practice is simple. Uh, you're sitting with each other and you're making eye contact, you're eye gazing, but not just for a moment, because you know, as we all do in some of these practices, we look in deep in the eyes and we get this insight, we get this sort of almost Akashic record downloading. But if you do this for 30 minutes, an hour, something else starts to happen. And what started to happen was at one point, uh, Gino almost knew, like he asked me something, where are you? And I started, my hearing started to change where the conversations that were happening next to us in the tea house on the other side was a conversation that happened and a question was asked about something. And then the conversation over the other side between two different people answered that question. And it was like a synchrony was starting to happen. Like, uh, what's the chance of that? Pretty low. And then we could hear music outside that talked to other music that was talking to other things. And there was a rising into a space of awareness. And in Luminous, we call it awake awareness. And, and it's our fundamental practices to get there through emptying our system absolutely and getting into awake awareness. That is how the healing can happen. That is how the sensing and attunement to another system can happen is when you become that awake and aware, but empty of content. You're, you're an exquisite observer. And then Gino said, now we get up and walk. It's time to get up and walk. So we, we got up and we walked. And as we walked and as we moved into the world, we felt the movement of people around us and the states they were in. And people would walk past and we could tell, and Gino would say, that person is in thought. And you can actually sense they're in thought. They're in the world, walking along the playa and their outfit and all dusty and everything, but they're actually contained in thought. The consciousness is like bundled up here. And then suddenly, and Gino probably remembers this, there was a big dreadlock guy, really lanky guy, a Rastafarian, zoomed past us on his bike, his just wreck of a bike, rattling bike. And we heard the squeal of brakes as he turned his bike around and came back to, to us. We could just, we could feel his presence moving. He came back to us and he stopped in front of us, in front of us and said, what's up? And Gino said, he is awake, he is tuned in. Maybe it's through his dreads, just like the Navi, you know, the, their dreadlocks tuned them into the tree of life and everything. He was a, awake, he was present in the world. And his system could tune in to other people who were present just instantly, like a spark recognizing another spark. And we just kept walking. But it was truly extraordinary. Um, and this, this goes to explain a number of things about meditation and presence and energy and transmission. And it's very, very s simple uh, experience to, to partake in. So it, um, it's, it's also very scientific in a way. It's very me mechanistic in that you, you have a practice that if you do it, it gets you to a place. That's a technology, that's a tool in the sense that it's science, but it's, it's a tool, it's science that leverages you into a amazingly connected state with a field in which improbable things, synchronous things are like Carl Jung described are happening in a higher and higher density. And then as you continue to walk into the playa, you stay attuned to that field, the field will walk you where you need to be. 
maybe you had the intention of finding an experience and frick it, the freaking field will walk you right into that experience. And Burning Man is such a densely connected field with enough awake beings and enough different chemistry, biochemistry, and enough density and enough levity and openness and hearts, things going on, that the field is really strong and can walk you around the playa. This is why people describe Burning Man as being just this magical uh, place where things just happen all the time. And, it, and perhaps it's one of our great laboratories uh, for trying this out. But I just want to nod to Gino to bringing uh, this understanding and simple tools to many people on the playa uh, and allowing them to experience the greater uh, synchronous and magical field that the playa could offer. So we have just two or three or four more. Any any quick comments or questions? Okay, I see a couple more raised hands. Um, we have Alexandros and then Carter. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Sure can. Yep. Okay, uh, very good to see you and uh, hear you. Thank you for uh, uh, this amazing talk and the conversation. And uh, obviously, thank everybody else who contributed. Um, I want to go back uh, slightly to the previous point when we're talking about consciousness and uh, anesthesiology. Um, and, and a point was made basically that uh, you know, if I can affect uh, consciousness by just administering an anesthetic, you know, um, what does that say about consciousness? I'm going to make a point that you probably like uh, I've already encountered, but I, I'd like your latest perhaps like thoughts on that sort of like comment uh, and the sort of picture of consciousness that it presupposes. Uh, the picture of consciousness that uh, I'm going to essentially like introduce is um, this whole idea of consciousness as a signal. So, you know, if, um, if this you know, body of ours and this brain of ours uh, it functions more like a receiver of sorts, um, then of course, like if you play with the receiver, you know, the signal will get lost and it won't come through clearly. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the nature of the signal. Uh, maybe it says some things, but it says more about uh, the nature of the receiver itself. If you look at uh, television and you look essentially at like people in there uh, talking, um, it wouldn't be very smart to try to open the television to find those people in there because they're not in there, right? Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, you know, um, what, a, what are your latest thoughts with respect to like this notion of uh, consciousness uh, more so as a signal and our body as a sort of receiver um, uh, with respect to, uh, you know, this uh, latest uh, understanding that you have uh, and you've developed and you've shared with us? Well, there's a, uh, a somewhat longer story and explanation of another experience when I asked that, that question that's probably too much to take up in the remaining minute or so. Uh, but it could be the subject of the, the next uh, uh, Levity Salon, this this very question. Um, but I, I would just hold it at that because of the late hour. And of course, you're welcome here and we're welcome always back here, Alexandros, and uh, to work on this. I know you sent me an email today. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to essentially joining the next one and exploring this in depth. Thank you so much. We want to um, squeeze in one more person. Carter is our last. Yeah, let's get here from Carter. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so something that keeps jumping in my mind, and I think it really relates to the story you just told from Burning Man, uh, Bruce, is um, I don't know if any of you all have read the book uh, Primary Perception by Cleve Baxter. Cleve Baxter um, started the polygraph unit in the CIA and had the top, uh, the top polygraph school in the country in New York City right when polygraphs were becoming a thing. Late in his lab one night in New York, uh, it was like four in the morning, he wanted to test something, but there were no test subjects there. So he hooked up his um, 
he had a thought, you know, plants give off electrodes, I can test electrodes on this. So he connected the polygraph unit to his draconian plant. And he poured in water and then coffee and thought one thing would happen, maybe something else happened, but really nothing significant happened. And then he had the thought, what if I burn this? And right when he had that thought, there's a huge jump in this chart. He walked in the other room, grabbed matches, came back, lit the matches, burnt the plant. At all those peak intervals, it went up to the same point when he first had the thought, what if I burned the plant? And during those, the times between those intervals, it went down, but stayed at a stress point. And it didn't go back down to that baseline until he put away the matches and no longer had the thought, what if I burn this plant? So it sent him on this whole journey of plant human biocommunication, which they have really great scientific studies for. And they realize that there is even an attunement between the plant and their caretaker. And one of the neatest things I think that really showed this is um, he had his plants hooked up to the electrodes, to the polygraph unit, and he went home with his lab partner to New Jersey, 100 miles away. Um, and his wife and lab partner threw a surprise birthday party for him. And when they went back to the lab, at the moment of the surprise, because they know what time it was, there were huge jumps in the chart, in the spike. And so it just really gave this idea of consciousness, what I understood as consciousness communicating on a non-human biocommunication level, I think really relates to um, what we've been discussing of the field. So I just want to leave you all with uh, that. Thank you, Carter. Um, this actually allows me to give a shout out that I was thinking of earlier, which is the work of Lauren Carpenter uh, at IONS. He's one of the researchers there. Lauren's a, a fascinating fellow. He's the inventor of Render Man and one of the co-founders of Pixar, the uh, animation studio that Steve Jobs got involved in. They made Toy Story and all that. So his technical chops are incredible. Render Man was the hardware and then the software that makes all of Pixar's films, for example. So when he joined IONS, he thought, how do we build a, de a detector for the field? Kind of like this, this fellow's polygraph. But how do we d build something that we can distribute to groups? Uh, and he'd worked out that it was faulty electronic parts that would generate, uh, they were very, very sensitive to noise in the environment. So he bought a, a ton of these faulty parts and built them into a little handheld supercomputer and distributes them all over the place so that they're in independent places. And this is very much like uh, the, the work that Roger Nelson had developed that Gauze was, was mentioning, sort of an upgrade to that, and, uh, and, and Dean Radin. And so these, he brought one of them to the Eclipse Festival to talk about it in his talk at Eclipse. It was just this handheld thing with all these resistor capacitor things that were all faulty, using them to you know, a very, a very field-based, uh, gearhead-based solution to uh, sense a very wooey, gooey thing called the field. And that work is ongoing. So watch this space. Uh, the work is getting more advanced. The, the instruments are getting more advanced. And perhaps like electricity in the 19th century, we will in this time, in our lifetime, characterize the informational, energetic, symbolic, probabilistic, uh, quantum chemical nature of this thing, which is a new communication medium, a new synchronization medium, a new visionary receiver transceiver medium uh, in our time, in, in the 21st century. And like electricity, it will generate uh, something so powerful that uh, engineers will try to tame it and turn it into products. And as, as you, you're seeing a little bit now with TransTech, um, and it will be one of the great new tools uh, in the century. And perhaps like the electron, like the command or the, not necessarily the taming of the electron, but the, the electron built a new nervous system. So the electron built a nervous system which could build the internet and 
microprocessors and computers, such that when good old Gaia sent us the first new pandemic of this century, called coronavirus COVID-19, it was just in time, not, not a year sooner, that we had a new nervous system in place called the Internet and Zoom and all these technologies that would allow us to operate our civilization, affect social distancing, develop vaccines, ship products, and, and avoid a billion deaths that would cert surely could have happened like the 1918-1919 Spanish flu if it had been here. And this nervous system, based on the electron, is allowing us to survive evolutionary torrents of viral loads and will continue to do so. So perhaps the field uh, will be our next electron, our next evolutionary nervous system that actually ties directly into our nervous systems, as this is doing right now. And it's a joyous time that we may be on the threshold of characterizing and discovering uh, this new thing. And, uh, and it truly is the, perhaps, the ulti ultimate merger of science and spiritual experience, uh, this, this great quest. So uh, anyhow, uh, with that, um, we're going to uh, kind of wrap it up now, and this will be uh, on the Levity Zone uh, podcast. I've, I'm going to put three of these up on the podcast uh, because the podcast has been months without an episode, so that's audio uh, podcast. Please subscribe. And one other shout-out is... Uh, if you'd like to uh, support this work going forward, I have a Patreon that was set up very kindly by Aaron, who's here, and by Charles. Uh, and just a couple of bucks a month, uh, we're pushing toward a thousand a month. That thousand a month, if I can get to fifteen hundred or two thousand a month, uh, it will really allow me to devote more time to this work uh, and and just provide me some freedom uh, from. Uh, kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, funding uh, potentially a new book, uh, chat books, new media, new tools. So if any of you uh, do have any of uh, that ability, I d deeply appreciate it. It's patreon.com slash Bruce Damer. Um, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to plug this stuff, right? But it, it truly is appreciated for all the effort. And you'll see uh, in a couple more weeks, we'll do another one. And I'm, I'm completely open to suggestions. One was course made tonight about the nature of of how the brain works and how visionary states come in and I have a hypothesis on that um, for another geeky topic there's also cosmogenesis how did the universe emerge and the laws of physics I've been working on that for about a dozen years and I have a cartoon model uh, that if anybody out there has good physics training uh, could be developed similar to the origin of life hypothesis um, but perhaps we can unmute everyone and give a shout out to each other for uh, surviving these two hours of very uh, heady uh, conversations.